good afternoon, friends. Uh, on behalf of Center for the Study of Developing Societies, I invite you to this new series of talk on relationship between society and the digital. Uh, this new series aims to explore this interaction between digital and the politics and other sphere of our social life. Uh, we are going to begin this series uh, with a talk uh, by Ipsita Haldar, and uh, she will be speaking on social media and the Kolkata Shias. Uh, what is interesting about today's talk is, first of all, I would like to introduce the speaker. Uh, Ispita is Associate Professor, Department of Comparative Literature, Jadavpur University, Kolkata. She was visiting fellow at the University of Erfurt, Germany, and at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London. And most importantly, her book is a fascinating book. Uh, the title of the book is Karbala, Nation, Islam, and Literature of the Bengali Muslims. And today, she is going to talk about social media and the Kolkata Shias. This is important because uh, usually we think of Muslims in this country as a homo homogeneous entity. And in this talk, we are going to talk about the manner in which minority within minority, the Shias, how do they claim, uh, how do they make claims on something which is a sphere, which is an intersection between social life and the digital. Over to you, Spita. Thank you very much, Professor Ian Ahmed, Hilal Ahmed, for introducing me and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank Professor Avadendra um, uh, Sharan and Professor Pratima Banerjee for giving me this opportunity to speak on my research at this very prestigious forum. And for me, it's very important because uh, I uh, not generally, I don't generally get, uh, I mean, scope to speak uh, on, on the research that I've been doing for a few years now. So uh, shall I speak from there? So um, today in my talk, I focus on how the Ethna Asharis, that is the 12 verse um, of Kolkata, refurbish their multiple religious place-making practices by responding to the globalizing effects of the internet and social media. I intend to show that in response to the new trans-territorial viewing, listening, and sonic practices and other engagements that virtual space offers, the Kolkata 12 verse as the new agents of virtual religious mediatization, reshape forms of Shiism as urban religion. In that, in that process, the online and the physical domains of religious activities remain co-constitutive and are produced only in relation to each other, lines of visibility and invisibility inherent in Shi rituals are redrawn as forms and sites of ritual actions are redesigned. I want to ask here, whether the 12 verse new religious imaginations and actions um, can lead us to consider such actions as their claim to a right to the city. Whether such particular line of inquiry, when applied to understand the dynamic forms of self-assertion and visibilization of the identity of the Shias as a doubly minoritized community, also in turn intrigue us to look at the idea of urbanity and urban religion beyond certain binaries. So, um, if we can play the slides now. I want to lead this discussion towards exploring that if we intend to conceptualize a typology uh, of South Asian urbanity in a reciprocal relation with religious mobilization from these discussions, what will be the ingredients to formulate that? The urban history of a Hindu majority Kolkata, forms of intra-Islamic rivalry and their lived context, online trans-territorial pools to bring all the coordinates of spatial temporal experience as the Shias for a new collective identification, reception of online experiences as the Shias in a Kolkata, 
in in kolkata as a regional mega city security as religious citizens all may define the typology or perhaps mark the difficulties to accomplish a typology of urbanity two others are uh, the that is the itna asharis are the major group in shia islam who believe in the intercessory power of the 12 imams from imam ali to imam mahdi they will be called 12 verse in my presentation they are the most vibrant users of social media and i will basically be talking about their use of facebook when i talk about the social media this is a work in progress i must tell you and at this point of my tentative formulation i feel privileged to share my ideas in this very distinguished forum i just want to share with you the possibilities of my material and the strength of my material and of course your critical feedback will be much valued and appreciated right to the city Right to the City, conceived and developed by Henry Lefebvre as the radical critique of the capitalist logic of the distribution of resources within the city, has offered wide understanding of inequalities and possibilities of individuation and socialization for urban dwellers, especially for several marginalized classes. The idea of the right to freedom, to individuation and socialization, to habitat and to inhabit in the context of contemporary urban conflict and political struggle raises important issues about the human rights of the marginalized and the minorities. The framework of rights to the city has also opened up discussions on citizens' mobilities across public spaces, participation in urban decision-making process and urban planning. Here in this ACA, uh, an attempt to discuss the right to the city for the religious subject offers us newer ideas about the articulation of demands for urban opportunities, socialization, and development of the creative potential of uh, religious subjects, communities in the urban context. I would like to start with a, a video that I have found on Facebook. This is called uh, Safar e Ishq. No, no, this one in the PPT. This one. This one. No, this one. No, the previous one, right. So um in in so uh we'll see in this procession, I I'll I'll tell you what's there in the video. In the procession, um is the traditional she flags of mourning, that is the red one symbolizing the blood of Hussein, the ultimate martyr, and the black one symbolizing grief, one can see Indian tricolor, small and big. In a monochrome black trail of Shia men in their mourning attire, some sporty participants flash fluorescent strips on their vests and sneakers. And we'll come back to this, I mean, the addition of color at the end of our discussion. But for now, uh, if we go to the next PPT, you will get, uh, get to see, I mean, this is uh, I'm, uh, I'm the template of Arab, I mean, Arbain, that is a very important Shia uh, global pilgrimage, has been emulated by the local Shias in the province. It is from Kolkata to a village called Sharunia. So, um, and also you can see in the next slide, the Shia Marja in Sharunia, the overarching presence of Ayatollah Ruhutullah Khomeini and Ayatollah Al Sistani on the long scroll like flexes that decorate the boundary of the venue 
of the congregation of Sharunya Imambara. The banner of Sharunya Imambara was redesigned the year the procession started with images of the two authorial figures of the Shia Marja II. People who have already noticed the public display of visual piety during Moharram in other Shia popular, populated religion regions, be it in megacities like Mumbai or cities with courtly paths like Lucknow or contentious locations like Leh and Kargil, will find these images of uh, Ayatollahs very common during Moharram. You may wonder, why am I highlighting it? Should their presence in Kolkata be treated as a unique case? I simply want to propose a nuanced and context-specific reading of the global cultural economy, facilitating newer identity formations of the Shias through the all-pervasive use of the internet and the social media and the introduction of the figures of uh, the Ayatollahs, uh, I mean, is a part of that. When I started visiting the Imambaras in Kolkata and in the nearby districts back in 2010, the Ayatollahs were nowhere, to, nowhere in sight. Sometimes I found them on calendars at homes. And generally, the Imambaras, even in Kolkata, did not have their images in the premises. Nobody seemed to be concerned about the supreme power that the Ayatollahs held over global politics and transterritorial Shia community. You will be surprised to know that it's only from 2020 to Moharram that the faces of the Ayatollahs were made part of Shia visuality in Kolkata. That too, in just one Shia locality, along uh, Metia Bru's main road. At another important site, Central Avenue, that is Rubindra Sharuni now, the Moharam procession has graphics and statements sourced from the internet. But the graphic artist did not reproduce the faces of the Ayatollahs on banners. Next slide, please. So you will see, what you see is Rubindra Sharuni here. This kind of visual piety as part of the Moharram complex in Bengal is entirely unprecedented and started quite late. Reception and appropriation of such transterritorial images, declaring Shia identity in political terms and not in cultural terms, is susceptible to the modes of specialities shared by the religious communities that the city has uh, evolved. Such visual publicity of transterritorial Shia identity and beginning of new religious activities like Safari Ishq came to the Twelvers of Kolkata in a package with new viewing sonic discursive experiences as an effect of the use of the internet and social media. And they started responding to it in more structured ways rather recently, say from 2016 onwards. <clears throat> The provincial ritualistic form suddenly were reconceptualized along what Arjun Appadurai called the media sustained global imagery. <laughs> Though Shiism essentially functions on trans transterritorial dimensions of affect, with Imam Hussein martyred in some distant land, the everyday ritual paraphernalia and new imaginations of identity evolved in that distant land were only readily accessible to the Shias anywhere, including Kolkata, because of the internet and social media, otherwise they were spatially disparate. As in today's talk, I'll be looking at the intertwining of urbanity reception of social media and Shia religious processes as forms of urban mobilization in Kolkata. We leave Sharunia now, we leave the village now. We approach Kolkata with the Shia movements after the pilgrimage, with Sharunia as our entry point to reach the city. The first curious observation is that when urban aspirations bring migrants from the villages to the megacities or media exposure to online religious, I mean, online religion mobilizes transborder traffic, both physically and symbolically, to Hussein Srauza in Karbala, the Kolkata Shias move from the urban neighborhoods to the hinterland in search of their Karbala. Responding to the impact of social media created uh, of the Arbaim. To engage with such new deliberations and urban aspirations that social media has brought to the Kolkata Twelvers, we need to see how the Twelvers redefine their identity as a transterritorial identity by adopting and appropriating the available resources of social media and responding from the material context 
of the urbanity of Kolkata. I'll discuss such aspirations as the 12 word Shias claim to a right to the city, primarily through the coordinates of their affirmative self-identification in the urban context of Kolkata, by engaging partly with their social media activities and also with a set of their new ritual practices in and around the Imambaras. Diasporic moves from Iran and intermittent migration of different ethno-linguistic and regional Muslim groups uh, to Kolkata from different parts of the Indian subcontinent created extensive forms of coexisting heterogeneity in Kolkata in the neighborhood through improvisational settlement and fractal growth, different communities were engaged in con constant con competition and negotiation among themselves for citifying their religion and ritual actions. But the communal lines were drawn and hardened most specifically after the partition in 1947, with the emergence of the refugee Hindu neighborhoods uh, and clustering of the Muslims in the ghetto-like formations, transforming co-specialities in a new Hindu-dominated public sphere in Kolkata. Shia settlements like in Metiabru's, uh, Toligonj, or pockets of Ripon Street, Canning Street, Chitpur, and the Rajabajar Maniktol areas through internal provincial migration started to be populated with Sunni communities from different regions and uh, cultures, bringing the Sunnis and the Shias into mutual spatial coexistence without overt micro-spatial segregation of their living quarters. The intra-Islamic conflict, rather than being understood as a public site of ritual actions for the public mobilization against the, I mean, Sunni polit political regime in various countries, such as, I mean, uh, Lebanon, Iran, and other, I mean, West Asian countries, um, and Bahrain, and other countries like this, is well studied. Such conflicts are inherent in the instrumental, I mean, in, inherent in the instrumental, uh, I mean, functioning of the post-colonial state, say, in the neighboring countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh, where, I mean, intra-Islamic rivalry be, remains a very important, I mean, contentious issue for the creation of governance, for the creation of, I mean, urbanity and for new, I mean, public policy making. Ashura processions in the Indian subcontinent show personal and collective devotion in comparison, in contrast, and reflect socio-economic and religious moorings so specific to the regions of the Indian subcontinent. While talking about the despecialized expansion of the networked community, we may echo what uh, Patrick Eisenlor said, that one mustn't lose sight of the national context while talking about the networked community as a despecialized space. I should mention here that my work is informed by Patrick Eisenlaw's work on media citizenship and religious mobilization of the 12 verse in Mumbai, but I would like to expand the discussion by locating urban aspirations and religious med mediatization of the Kolkata 12 verse in regional difference as well. As far as intra-Islamic conflict is concerned, Mumbai and Lucknow are two cities where intra-Islamic rivalry directly impacted uh, Muslim minority religious groups competitive sharing of public space for religious mobilization, inviting many a times administrative intervention articulated in various points of history uh, by banning the Ashura processions to ease out Sunni-Shia relationship. And the communal relations, uh, I mean, are much more intense in Mumbai too, that Eisenlor also marks in his discussion of the religious activities of the Shias. In my discussion of the rights to the city, I intend to remain very site and, I mean, region specific by highlighting the difference in context uh, of uh, Mumbai, uh, Lucknow, and Kolkata. I also look at Kolkata not as a homogeneous city space, but I intend to underline the diverse micro level urban configurations impacting on the consumption of the social media resources and their articulation. And when we talk about the Shia community, the 12 verse, in the conglomeration of the Shias, it is also, also a monolithic community in terms of its class, in terms of its aspirations, and also in terms of its, I mean, locational, uh, uh, say, I mean, settlement. The Shias are multiple, even the 12 are multiple in Kolkata. Coming back to Kolkata, we notice that in Metia Bruce, which is a Sunni populated area now, near Siptainabat Imambara, there is no mosque along a two kilometer stretch along Metia Bruce main road, where Siptainabat Imambara, stands as the replica of Bara Imambara of Lucknow. And the addition of the Ayatollah's images does not interrupt the already existing Sunnishya co-specialities. If we go to the next slide, please. 
But if we look at the stretch of Rovindra Sharoni, where two early mid 19th century Imam Baras, Golkoti and Bagwali Koti are standing, we see a more complex format of coexisting heterogeneity and co specialities. So, what you see uh, there, you can see three very old mosques along uh, Central Avenue, that is Rovindra Sharoni, and three, these three active mosques stand near the Golkoti Imambara. It's hardly a 30, 300 to 400 meters distance between an Imambara and a mosque here. Even if there are microphones to amplify the nohas, that is elegies being played or chanted inside the Imambaras during the Moharam days, the sound fades away, say after 100 meters. The ecology of the Shia sound of mourning is technically fashioned in such a way that it does not disrupt the Sunni soundscape and the sound of Azan takes over in intervals. But in the Metia Bruce area, the number of microphones are higher because of the absence of any mosque in, I mean, two kilometers of stretch around Siptayanabad Imambara. And the sound spread farther, uh, spreads farther away from Siptayanabad Imambara. And the sound from the mics goes farther for the absence of the ambit of Sunni sonic atmosphere in close proximity. It is also important to note that the disruption of communal harmony resulting from the demolition of Babri Masjid, of the Babri Masjid 1992 and the Godra incident 2002, so acutely felt in Mumbai, there are lots of studies available on this that did not impact Kolkata as severely, ensuring that the Bengal government did not need to take differential policies along communal lines as it happened in the case of Mumbai. Extraordinary communal hatred did not perform physically in Bengal, resulting in communal clashes once the climactic days of the partition violence was over, I mean, were over. But communal sentiments in Kolkata solidified the cordons between the mainstream city space and Muslim lives in the ghettos. As the cordons were heightened and normalized, Ignorance about the Muslims grew intense in mainstream Hindu society. And in the level of governance, it is reflected in the lack of state policy for economic security and the absence of urban facilities in the Muslim neighborhoods. But ignorance may not be very innocent for the internalization of various hegemonic ideas about the Muslims that can end up in one believing in and projecting the same stereotypical image of the Muslims in the city without any critical self-reflection. Self Let me play uh, a trailer, the trailer of a film, uh, Zulfikar here. This is directed by uh, a director called uh, Srijit Mukherjee, who can uh, no way be termed as possessing some staunch Hindu, Hindu inside. He is a representative of so-called secular liberal intelligentsia of uh, Bengal. So. whole game is about the food chain, man. We all are a part of it. Grasshopper, man, pudding, grass khave. The grasshopper ke gain away rat, man, Hindur. Then the bloody snake is going to slither in and eat up the rat. And at the very end will come the hawk flying in from the sky. Wo saap kuda ke lege jayega aur kha bhi lega. Aar Manush, Manush nahi food chain hai? Ehi, Elaka. Kolkata is a small country. Hmm, country. Oh, Jatiya Shongi has been cut off. Nishan, Nishan, the Kuli Company. So you see, there is a kind of mystic cognition of uh, ritual activities like self-flagellation, and the ritual sacred blood is, I mean, superimposed with the blood shedding at the butcher's shop and the blood of homicide. So this is like, it is like, uh, of course, the director is in search for visual exotica that he finds in the Moharam procession. But I mean, the outcome of this kind of, I mean, popular imagery and popular mediascape would again, I mean, harden and solidify the inherent orient orientalist idea about the Muslims. So in the face of such denial, rejection, and super celebration of typically orientalist imagination of the Muslim other within, within, 
without within and without any uh, ethical check ashura processions with the diverse sensory practices like chanting whose sense name with the vigorous stress beating and self flagellation stands for symbolic self affirmation and validation of shia identity in the urban public sphere in kolkata itself so you look at uh, ashura procession at it stands like a symbolic of any sort of uh, symbolic to deny the mainstream understanding of muharram the hyper visuality of the ashura always catches the researchers eyes for its strength as a reminder of the invalidation of the sunni uh, caliphate and at the same time of social marginality and precariousness of living as a doubly minoritized community of the shias but my proposal here is li little different if we want to understand the 12 us claim over the public space and negotiation with the systems of hierarchy and asymmetry as their right to the city ashura processions in kolkata may not give us an adequate idea of to what extent the online experience of the shias are intertwined with their new urban aspirations that is new forms of realization of their trans territorial belonging and need for visibilization of their identity to claim their position in the city without much dramatic rupture in the ashura roots as it happened in mumbai Uh, or communal and intra-islamic tension always looming large in the day of uh, on the day of ashura in lucknow and mumbai the kolkata 12ers continued to traverse the same routes fixed during the time the major imambaras were consecrated in the shia localities along the newly formed routes mitiaburu's main road prince anwarsha road and central avenue they continued to abide by the traffic rules issued for the ashura and replicating the same old codes of ritual performance without any direct utterance of intra islamic dissent communal or political mobilization other than the adoption of the quotations of the iconic figures uh, i mean uh, uh, quotations uh, from the digital media iconic shia figures were also absent in the ashura procession and its structure also remained the same that's why i moved to other processions like safar ishq which not only put the shia public demonstrations on a global network but without the sensoriness of heightened chest beating and self flagellation that such processions offer uh, other versions of publicity or and urban religiosity for the shia so i move away from self flagellation and chest beating as forms of dissent and forms of critical mobilization as right to the city and i rather look at other forms of rituals reformulated with the experience of social media and i talk about other processions and also online activities let me specify the scheme of uh, structural and creative changes in the patterns of ritual participation in a nutshell in the middle of the 1910 uh, in in that decade exposure to the trans territorial images rituals and discourses widely available in digital media especially uh, through the cd circle creation of the cds and the dvds and then online ush, online experience ushered in various shift by inculcating new forms of viewing listening and performing carrying one cell phone camera to the ritual space and recording ritual mourning on the cell phone camera became almost mandatory for the ritual action itself facilitating connections with the sacred through virtual processes that involves the posting of recorded videos on facebook as an i quote almost banal feature of the event i quote as an eyes and lord but new rituals were introduced inside the imambaras and older ones were modified new ritual processions were introduced as the wide reception of social media resources we then Uh, which then again go back to the virtual domain by getting recorded edited and posted on walls of the participant mourners of karbala so what we see is the emergence of local agents who are the local orthodoxy who act from below to create a new understanding and interpretation of religion and create an online public there these media practices suddenly broke down the logic of visibility and invisibility as shiism was emerging as a new form of under, uh, urban religion since these media practices made the rituals inside the imam ward as ordinary with the easy accessibility and availability of uh, urban media here i need to mention two differential aspects here in the uses of social media that is one linguistic demographic that is the use of social media in the districts which uh, are basically bangla speaking are different from the kolkata experience in kolkata the shias are generally urdu speaking or mostly hindi speaking so they could create a kind of linguistic community online through the use of english romanized version of urdu and then hindi and also the romanized version of hindi 
which the Shias in the district, uh, I mean, do not, and they cannot become a part of that because of their lack of exposure in both Urdu and Hindi. And also there is a gender divide in the use of uh, the social media. And I can come back to this in the discussion session after my talk, because here I'm not highlighting the gendered aspect right now. So next slide, we can see how the male-female majlis, uh, majlises take place. So next slide, please. So this is the majlis for female and uh, this is for the male participants. So um, with the entry of the individual Shias with their personal accounts on Facebook since 2016, a radical shift is observed as the Shias now claim and secure their identity as the Shias as part of an online public. Previously, it was only in the Ashura processions that identification of the Shias was possible who otherwise remained unmarked as a Muslim subgroup in a Hindu majority public domain, which actually look at the Muslims as a, at the Muslims as a cluster without any sort of uh, class or sectarian, I mean, uh, demarcation. However, we need to remember that in the Muslim populated neighborhoods, identification as the Shias means an uneasy intra-Islamic difference. Social media brought to the 12ers an unimaginable opportunity to belong to a Shia identified transterritorial community as an online public, inducing a strong sense of confidence by providing the global template of Shiism. Today, for the paucity of time, I'll limit my discussion to the functions of only one Facebook account named Calcutta Azadari, account opened in 2016. Until date, it has 3,800 plus uh, members to follow. Um, uh, which remains, Calcutta Azadari remains most active in sharing available online resources and posting new recorded ones, and in turn, contributing instrumentally in organizing new tenets of Shiism online, along with Calcutta Azadari, by engaging with the architectural renovations in the built-in space of Bibi Anaru Imambara, one of the, I mean, perhaps the oldest Imambara in Kolkata, uh, and, and ritual innovations that Bibi Anaru Imambara accommodates, I'll try to understand the function of the Shias as an online public. We can see the preference of the Kolkata 12ers for three kinds of online material that are in circulation across the Shia network community. Please change the PPT. So this is Bibiana Remambara, and this is the page of Calcutta Azadari. So the next slide. So this is like graphic material and ethical statements in the voice of the Shia Imams, uh, announcements of events. This come, this, this are very popular among the 12 Shias. This is the most circulated material. And second, next audio, please. Next to next. So the audiovisual rendition of the Nohas and various Noha Khans and uh, I mean singers from uh, Pakistan, they're very, very popular across the whole subcontinent. They're Nadim Haider, I'm Nadim Sarwar, Irfan Haider, and there are lots of such, I mean, performers. Third, next slide, the Azadiri sermons as standardized discourses. These three kinds of posts uh, ha have become the core elements of Facebook, I mean, uh, space uh, used by the 12 Shias. And I would say that the 12 Shias, they are, a, I mean, visual sonic community. So they are not very interested in the sermons. So in six months, you will get one or two advertisement and announcement for the sermons. So rather, it's a kind of very provincial, vernacular kind of sonic and visual experience that they, I mean, and they are more engaged with and they become the consumer and creator of. In this social mediatized religious imagination, the sacred shrines with the supreme presence of Hussein Mosoliam in Karbala, Raza, uh, Hussein's Raza in Karbala, Ali's in Najaf, Abbas is in uh, Karbala, and Hussein's sister Zainab's in Syria become more, uh, I mean, familiar visual tropes through the wide circulation of graphic textual material and music videos of Noha on social media. Noha means the elegies of Muharram. But if we look at the reception of such resources and artifacts in Kolkata for the despecialized networked community, intermediate sites come up re-energizing older supra-regional connections and envisaging new ones, interpreting trans-territoriality in multi-local intermediary terms. So between the trans-territorial global and the provincial, Kolkata provincial, you get multiple stops, multiple intermediaries, which, I mean, specializes and temporalizes the trans-territorial experience of the Kolkata Shias. So, and that brings both, uh, I mean, linguistic and structural change in the built-in space and also language means the rhetoric of ritual 
and change, I mean, material change in the built-in space. So I'll be discussing the modalities of emplacement of identity reflected in the reformulation of the materiality of the congreg congregational sites, mostly discernible in the renovation of architecture and newly added ritual paraphernalia and in the innovation in aesthetic norms and references online. Then again, also we need to highlight the micro-local specificities of the Kolkata neighborhoods to facilitate such endeavors. Next slide, please. So you see three uh, very old Imambaras. So you can see how mid in mid 19th century, prior to uh, the 1957, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, 19, uh, I mean, 1857, uh, how religious mobilization were at place in Kolkata and Kolkata, how Kolkata as a colonial, I mean, economic, cultural city actually emerged through the religious mobilization centering on these Imambaras. It is worth noticing how some of the Imambaras so far treated as minors in terms of their lineage and significance in the Shia demography in Kolkata have started becoming very proactive in their reorganization of rituals and spaces of ritual performance, thus attracting more visitors and acquiring significant status in mobilizing religious action in the competitive micro sites of the Imambaras. Next to the celebrated Siptanabad Imambara, revered for his princely lineage, because Shah Waliallah came when he was exiled, so he consecrated this Imambara, Siptanabad Imambara, as a replica of his favorite Bara Imambara, Isla in Lucknow. And there, uh, through his royal family and courtesans and uh, artisans and also courtiers who came with him, they actually mobilized the settlement of the Muslim community, Shia Muslim community there. And there were Haji Kirbala Imambara and Golkoti Imambara, noted for their capacity to consolidate the Twelvers in different parts of central Kolkata since the mid 19th century. Bibi Anari Imambara, which was founded in 1833, older than all these three establishments, used to be of secondary importance, serving only the purpose of the neighborhood. The potential for implementing new aspiration and models with the aim for Modifying the special use of the Imambaras is intertwined with many factors. That's why these three prolific Imambaras, they could not become a part of this architectural renovation, whereas uh, Bibianaro could. So, and this kind of differential aspect can lead us to the idea of the right to the city. So these uh, tenets are the capacity to use, I mean, social media, the social demography of the neighborhood and the position of the Imambaras in the city, which facilitates such innovations, a proactive, uh, the proactivity of the trustee board towards implement, implementing innovative ideas and above all, the availability of resources. Unlike Bibianore Imambara, which has a considerably large courtier to host a good number of male mourners for the congregation, Basravi Masjid and Imambara, Canning Street, does not have a courtier inside and stands in a crowded trade quarter of the city that is the Barabazar area, making it difficult to implement renovations of the outer structures. If we go to the next slide, please. So you see Basravi Masjid and Imambara here, keeping the outside structure intact, only the interior of Basravi Masjid and Imambara was renovated in 2021-22 by installing impressively longish marble slabs covering the western wall with Arabic calligraphy inscribed on the slabs. The illegitimacy of Arabic calligraphy on the walls, which previously had just a whitewashed kind of finish, adds an epic grandeur to the regional mourning hall where now the impeccably dressed Zakir from Lucknow-centric North India presides over the sermon and morning rituals. Interestingly, in Sittenabat Imambara, which has continued to hold an important position in the Shia religious ecosystem in Kolkata due to its historical cultural significance and royal lineage, tra traditions of morning ritual and the built-in space are protected from such innovation so as to not disrupt the Imambara's capacity to invoke the memory of a pre-colonial Lucknow, the lost homeland of the exiled Nabab Wajid Ali Shah. The old color scheme, too, has continued without any change in the paraphernalia of rituals or ritual artifacts. The morning hall, glittering with the multicolored glass chandeliers, 
keeps exuding the nostalgic royal charm that came with the Nawab and acts as one of the most attractive Islamic historical sites on the tourist map of Kolkata, acquiring almost a secular aura. The resemblance in color scheme, if we go to the next slide, the resemblance in co the color scheme between the blue and white walls and the fa facade of Siptainabad Imambar and the state government's chosen official color code is merely coincidental, but one can discern an unarticulated sense of ease and to some extent a sense of relief and belongingness felt by the inhabitants of Metia Bruce, Sunnishia alike. Compared to this, situations were more conducive for, for Bibiana Remambara with available space, resources, enthusiastic trusty board, its position in the corner of a minor road in a Muslim populated locality, and active social media users residing in the vicinity of the Imambara who come and participate on a regular basis. It's 190 year old. Uh, single story humble structure, if we go to the next slide, has been transformed into an impressive two story building whose windows and facades, columns and stairs all now resemble Indo Persian architectural templates. Adding to this, the space of congregation in the open courtyard for any ritual location is now adorned with reproduced images of the Ayatollahs, uh, Sayyid Ruhatullah Khomeini, Sayyid Ali uh, Husseini Al Sistani, and um, Ali Husseini Khomeini and others from the 56 current Ayatollahs who were completely absent in the ritual space before. Though in the ritual space of the Imam Baras, the assemblage of the traditional relics related to the Battle of Karbala was maintained, there is a change in their materiality and aesthetics, now mostly synchronized with the trans-territorial visual tropes. For the absence of artisanal practices for the Shia ritual relics in Kolkata, they are generally bought from Lucknow. In Golkoti Imam Bara, where not a single inch in the built-in structure is modified, a new uh, compact version of Hussein's Rosa, along with a set of severed arms of Abbas and an exquisite, I mean, water dispenser symbolizing the acute thrust, I mean, thirst in the Battle of Karbala in brass and copper are added recently. They are brought from Mumbai last year before Muharram 2022. The senior Mos Nauha Khan Asghar Ali told me beaming with joy. As already mentioned, the logic of social media has broken down the prevalent idea of visibility and invisibility related to sermon preaching. Since numerous audiovisual clips of the morning sessions inside the Imam Baras, sermon presided by the clergy <clears throat> and elegies chanted by the general male participants with chaste beating are recorded through the personal cell phone cameras of the mourners. These are circulated online to their Facebook accounts, Kamran Mirza, in his late 40s, the admin of Calcutta Azadri, and he, incidentally, the descendant of Nawab Wajid Ali Shah told me, I quote, we are engaged on Facebook to show and preserve what Shiism is and how that's followed by the Shias in different Imambaras of Kolkata, Kotens. He became the first user of, the fa of Facebook to utilize the capa uh, capabilities of social media as an online archive for the Kolkata 12ers. Eventually, new personal accounts as well as community pages emerged to maintain regularity and present uh, and present a more professional air. Another admin, Ali Haider Wasim in his 30s, was added to Calcutta Azadiri, who was ready to devote substantial time to update the page three or four times daily, while also maintaining his personal account, which too, he now devotes to the cause of community sensitization. Calcutta Azadiri has opened itself up for contributors from other users on Facebook with the exclusive aim of obtaining the recordings related to Shia intercessory piety. Gradually, these users, um, that is the online Shia publics began to become observers of their own religious actions and formed an online archive in a participatory mode, quite akin to what was termed as online religion by Christopher Helland. Now, when the clergy from Lucknow holds up uh, their, I mean, clergy from Lucknow hold up their star smartphones at aids to read during preaching sessions, replacing the older, uh, usually they used to follow the, I mean, books, I mean, bound books, bound volume books. Now they, I, I mean, pick up their cell phone and uh, read out from that. And that way they legitimize both the apparatus and the methodology that is both cell phone and mediatization as methodology. Uh, I mean, they validate that. 
paradigmatically changing the idea of local orthodoxy, a term used by uh, Tala Lhasa that I want to bring back here. The emergence of Bibi Anaru in the Kolkata Shia demography with more structured rituals and renovated architecture, its courtyard armed with videographers and common participants constantly turning the rituals into mediatized religious artifacts has created a phenomenal urban event. Its emergence as the most sought after ritual site induced an ethos of competitive urban aspirations by increasing the consumption of social media discourses to find templates in the microsites of Kolkata. So along with the Indo-Persian facades and arched windows, a fountain was installed in the courtyard at the center of a newly built water tank with water gushing out in special occasions from the mouth of a mushk, the water bag of Sayyid Abbas, the half brother of Hussein, who was killed by the enemy while bringing water for the thirsty children of Hussein's family. So in the next slide, you would see the facade with the water tank installed at the right-hand side now starkly resembles the Darga Hazrat Abbas in Lucknow and reveals the decision of the trustee board of Bibi Anaro of designing its renovation on the Lucknow model to come up on the trans-territorial map. Hazrat uh, I mean, Dargai Hazrat Abbas has the influence of Mughal Indo-Persian architecture elements that get further provincialized in Bibi Anaru Imambara. What is so curious to notice is that the multiple arches that hold the roof and the elongated dome above in Hussein's Raza in Karbala have found uh, their place in Bibi Anaru Imambara. If you look at the right-hand side image and if we go to the next PPT, the only difference is the addition of the secondary story, second story, which multiplied the number of arches and created extra space for uh, the female devotees to congregate. I'll come back to the female uh, devotees um, at the end of my discussion. One is utterly impressed and humbled, however, when in a rather dingy and shabby Hare Krishna Pona road, named after a prolific communist of Bengal, full of small mushroom-like houses, rickety buildings, lacking basic amenities, a Muslim marriage hall, small shops and warehouses, the entry gate of Bibi Anaru Imam Bara reveals itself. Now recalling the memory of Imam Hussein's exquisite Rosa in Karbala city. The gold-plated mighty central dome on Hussein's Rosa when added to the gate of Bibi Anna Rimambara in 2018, however, it has been, uh, I mean, reduced to a more manageable painted version of the original. The minarets in the Rosa naturally have uh, become tiny beside the dome. This resemblance signifies two aspects of this new religious urbanism that is never linearly ordained between the trans-territorial and the regional domains, and instead connected to various other spaces and history of those spaces and gets vernacularized. This happens in primary two ways. First, it re-energizes the traditional Abbas-centric piety through architectural renovations and innovations. Secondly, it recasts the traditionally intermediate position of Lucknow as the most viable locus to legitimate Kolkata's connection with trans-territorial cosmopolitanism. So what we can say is structural renovations in the built-in space of Bibiana or Imambara are creative strategies to bring the Shias out of their provincial vernacular domain. At the same time, such endeavors vernacularize the trans-territorial. What I want to mark is the emergence of newer, newer kind of vernacular cosmopolitanism at the core of the place-making practices and forms of claiming a right to the city. And I, I can see them as defining urban religion and urbanism for the Kolkata dwellers. To expand the discussion of the tenets of vernacular cosmopolitanism, we move on to the new aesthetic imagination cultivated through the music videos. So if we go to the next slide, we would see that a local video, young local artist in his mid-20s, Atif Ali Khan, belonging to the extended family of Baregula Mali Khan, adopted digital media in 2018 to begin marking uh, music videos, making music videos for online dissemination, both on his Facebook and YouTube accounts, and he has an Insta account as well. The daily based graphic artist with whom Khan collaborated shows only stock images of 
who sends Rosa in the beginning, and she are transteritorial ritual motifs from the internet. The graphic artist is the admin of the online platform, she are multimedia team, which remains very instrumental in this, I mean, transteritorial connection as well. So I bring back the notion of multi-locality of this transteritoriality uh, again. In the gradual growth of Khan's stylization, both gestural and musical, following transregional codes, proportionate with the increasing finesse of the music videos as technical productions, he has become one of the local agents to represent the initiatives of the Kolkata 12ers to contribute in creating a global and cosmopolitan religious community. In the recent music, music videos, Bibi Anaru Imambara becomes integral to the cosmopolitan demography as Khan is seen here, not only superimposed on the trans territorial images, but also prostrating on the steps of Bibi Anaru Imambara before waking up to the hall. And if you look at the right-hand side image, it is Bibiana Imambara at the backdrop. The central edifice of Bibiana Imambara, the mushk of Abbas, the leather bag of Abbas, recurs in his music videos now, where such architectural cues and more stylized forms of performance readily merge to facilitate the revamped vernacular locals belonging to the global framework. To give another example before I end, before I conclude, Calcutta Azadiri shared a music video that we see in the next slide uh, on May 12, 2022, which was a recreation of an already existing music video of the Noha, Ayahu Tere Darpe, I Have Come to Your Door, produced in Lucknow using visuals shot at Darga -e -abba, Darga -e Hazrat Abbas and with audio taken from the website of Farhan Ali Warsi of Karachi, Pakistan. In the Kolkata video, which was readily produced in just say um, three days, posted on May 15, 22, 2022, made by Ali Haider Wasim. You remember him? He was the new admin, added admin of Calcutta Azadari. Bibi Anna Ro enters the field of aesthetic represent representation by replacing the Lucknow Darga from the original visual while keeping the Noha from Karachi intact. Such aesthetic innovations supported by architectural renovations, the most significant eligibility factor here in creating transterritorial dimensions of vernacular Shiism, contributed towards the standardization of sound practices and musical genres integral to the morning rituals. In the second music video made in Kolkata, Ayahu Tere Darpe, the mushk in the water tank of Bibi Anna Imambara becomes a central motif. Facilitating identification with the figure of the Shia Marja, you look, you can find them in the background, looking down from the flakes on the wall towards the backdrop. So to conclude, um, the internet and social media have helped the Shias start practicing their religiosity as a globalized and cosmopolitan vernacular community. So by placing before you a few instances of the dynamic forms of adaptation and appropriation of the online resources by the Shias to identify themselves as a trans territorial community and in turn, their additions to the online resources and related transformations in the physical enactment of rituals, I have attempted to mark the Shia claims to the right to the city. I would like to consolidate this discussion by offering some nodal criteria for such a reciprocity between urbanity and religious mobilization. One, suffer ish, a lens and context to define Shia urbanism. Firstly, suffer ish as a ritual innovation from Kolkata to the village, mobilize the Shias as a trans territorial collective, and at the same time, um, energize the supra regional connections again with Lucknow as the template. So it's only when the Chehlum, I mean, rituals in Lucknow was posted online, posted on Facebook, that the Shias in Kolkata started responding to it. It's not that the, I mean, much media covered Arbine in global, I mean, in the global site actually instigated the Kolkata Shias to adopt the ritual called Arbine. It's actually the ritual in Lucknow that inspired them, which they got access to via uh, Facebook. It affirms the multi-local spatial mediations to define an online public and tenets of vernacular cosmopolitanism of global mediatized urban religion. Secondly, when this urbanism occurs, a so far unactualized connection between the megacity and its hinterland. So I need to just clarify here, 
that is uh, the Imambara centric, I mean, uh, Ashura procession, they're very, very micro, micro local specific. And uh, on the day of Ashura, some Imambaras come together to congregate to create a main procession but they are generally micro-locally specific and there has, has not been any connection between the Imambaras and the Ashura processions in the districts and uh, the Kolkata experiences. So this is a kind of major phenomenal shift that, I mean, that happens with this, with the beginning of the safari ish. Then another question arises, what makes global cultural economy take uh, a reverse route from Kolkata to village Sharonia? That will, again, that will again expose the specific interpretation of the intra-Islamic rivalry by the 12 verse, interpreted, I mean, by the 12 verse as the basic tenet of their urban religion. Safar Ishq was first introduced in Metia Bruz in 2016, but it could not be continued as intra-Islamic unrest started brewing in the area. Then Kathal Bagan Imambara was chosen as a start of point to facilitate a 72 kilometer long walk through a demography where such a new procession would not destabilize the say patterns of intra-Islamic or speciality. Neither Utid invoke communal anis. My observation is that the Shias, while accessing a plethora of online material and in turn performing them, remain extremely careful about maintaining the apparent non-threatening or at least less conflicting nature of intra-Islamic relationship in Kolkata. And they abstain from bringing any rupture in the public sphere by proclaiming an anti-caliphate stance. And they never, I mean, post any sort of graphic material that otherwise uh, carries this anti-caliphate uh, sentiment and sensibilities, which are, I mean, widely available. When Kamran Meza posted the frontal image of Sittanabad Imambara decorated to celebrate Eid -e Gadir, he simply cropped out the ayatollahs whose images were added to both sides of the get. This is the third year after Eid -e Gadir was introduced to Kolkata. In Eid -e Gadir, the Shias celebrate what Prophet Muhammad announced about Imam Ali in Khum, in a place called Khum, Man Kunto Mola Fahza Aliun Mola, that is, uh, whose Mola, uh, 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 who I am, I am Mola to those persons whose Mola is Ali. Considering it to be Muhammad's public choice of Ali as the first caliph over the Sunni first caliph Abu Bakr, while the social media accounts are flooded with the graphics of Eid -e Gadir, the public space has been utilized very carefully so as to avoid any in, in, intra Islamic controversy. Mirza told me, I quote here, starting the celebration of Eid -e Gadir is about inculcating confidence among the minoritized Shias, so, so that they know history. But that doesn't mean they will be challenging something out there. That will only invite uncomfortable situation for the Shias and disrupt our coexistence in Kolkata. My second point, social media as the third space to claim right to the city. And if we go to the next slide. From the capitalist geography of the Western world, where uh, the right to the city means democratic inclusiveness and equal access to all working class groups, here the idea of right to the city is expanded when applied to understand the right to difference, to be different, to address various kinds of disenfranchisement faced by a religious minority in a post-colonial city like Kolkata. Both right to the city and spatial justice talk about access to urban opportunities available in the public space. In the idea of the right to the city, two main rights are imagined for the inhabitants. One, the right to participate centrally in the production of urban space, and two, the right to appropriate the urban space. To appropriate the urban space, along with the strategic use of the physical space of ritual enactment, social media is made integral to the social space for the Shia's, Shia 12-verse placemaking actions. The functions direct aesthetic formations or appropriation by consumption of the Shia online publics intrigue us to consider social media as what Edward Soha termed as uh, the third space. The space of representation where the religious citizens claim over rights to the city can be articulated. As the Shias in their placemaking practices don't really make claims on any specific rights entailing access to urban facilities or claims on citizenship, or try to actively contribute in urban planning or mobilize politically as a political critic, their articulation of difference online and in the physical space should be considered as a proclamation for social justice. Three, 
the online counterpublics and right to the city. Following this line of argument that I have presented, we cannot call the Shia online public a counterpublic, which is an idea based on resistance and public mobilization and poly political mobilization. In my observation, the Kolkata Shias do not intend to counter the mainstream public sphere. Rather, with their online and offline religious mobilizations, they tactfully negotiate with it. And sometimes they borrow cultural elements in a process of resilience to claim their right to the city. And I end by showing my last uh, slide. So what you see uh, is um, an incident, a ritual from 2019. Uh, so uh, a tram was hired by the 12 us of CIT Road. The tram went from Park Sarkas Moidan tram depot to cover Moulali, Esplanade and Maidan, decorated with balloons and ribbons, marigold garlands, flex banners with eulogies of Hussein tied on the outer body of the tram. Eulogies for Hussein played inside the tram. Such a celebrated mode and different new forms of mourning like safar -e ishq uh, show that rather than publicizing their identity as an open public challenge to the Sunni Caliphate or articulating their difference in communal terms, the 12 verse creatively produce multiple ways to come out in public on occasions other than the Ashura for the socialization of Shiism as an everyday un urban uh, religion of Kolkata. So you see one of the organizers speaking to the public, speaking to the media, the organizers emphasized how in the whole world, only Kolkata celebrated the birthday of Imam Hussein on a tram and also declared among other things, confirming their belief in religious coexistence in the city by showing a placard and saying, I quote, our Rubindranath Tagore said that Hussein is the ultimate symbol of insaniyat, humanity, the quote ends. Though generally, where exactly Tigor said this uh, is hard to find. But here, you know, a circle is completed. The film trailer that I showed, the, I mean, Shia quarters were dissociated from the city of culture, that is city of culture, that is Kolkata, that is marked by the presence of Tigor. Now the Shias, they're claiming Tigor to validate I mean, their intercessory piety and their religion as an urban religion in Kolkata. So I end here. Thank you very much for your kind listening. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, speaker. Excellent presentation. I have many things to say, but uh, I distract myself. So floor is open for comments and questions. Many. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. And uh, the ways in which you have articulated your fieldwork is excellent. Uh, basically, two big comments, rather questions. Uh, one, I would term it consensus, uh, because the manner in which the image of Ayatollah, you just mentioned it, but it would be great if you just elaborate that. Uh, the image of Ayatollah, especially the image of Ayatollah Khomeini uh, is important. And what is the significance of that image in creating consensus? Consensus meaning that especially Shia-Sunni rivalry is so powerful uh, that in order to make a consensus, you need a figure. And Khomeini is that figure because Khomeini is known primarily because of Salman Rajdi. But there is other side of Khomeini, which is creating a new consensus in the Islamic world after the revolution. So that aspect, uh, do you think that that aspect was important in order to use this symbol to, and then the way you conclude it, uh, you know, evoking Hussein's birthday, relating it as a non-conflicting entity and creating a some kind of an, uh, you know, consensus building insight uh, the larger Muslim sphere, which you conceptualize. That's one kind of thing which I find fascinating in your presentation. Second thing is, uh, which I call reconfiguration. Now, Shia Islam, and especially Shia Islam in India, is relatively open to the idea of image. So if you go to Imam Bada's in, say, for instance, Lucknow, you find the image of Hussein and Ali as well, inside chamber, not outside chamber. So they try to keep those images inside, not to hurt the sentiments of others, but the image building, uh, especially in Persian Islam, as well as the Persian Islam, Persian Shia Islam 
coming to this part of the world, especially in uh, Lucknow. Now, because of that, the question of image is central here. So I, you know, I was interested in looking at how um, this new kind of images, which are digital images, are interpreted by the re religious scholars. And I find a very interesting, uh, you know, debate inside Sunni as well as in Shia uh, scholars on this question. So my question was, and I, you know, I interviewed a few, and my question was, why you would allow someone to take a picture and keep that picture in your pocket? Is it Islamic or not? So, uh, you know, there were basically two opinions. One opinion was that it is an image, so it is forbidden, so you cannot have image at all. The other one, the liberal one, was different. So they made a very interesting dis distinction between storage and the physical presence of the image. So they said that we are not storing the image physically, so there is no physical image. These are moving images, and they also made a distinction between moving images and the still thing. So they said that moving images are different from the still images. So therefore, making a video, delivering sermon, sermon, and then circulating is permissible, not the still images. But there is third position. The third position is that the still images are also not stored in physically. So therefore, they are also permissible. You may find very similar kind of responses from the Shia uh, scholars as well. But because Shia Islam is quote unquote, more uh, open towards the question of image. I think what is there, what, what makes them specific is something which we really would like you to spell out. Now, the third point is about uh, the, specific, is the specific formation of online, online uh, You concluded that they are, they are very conscious, but is there any way in which we can make a distinction between this kind of Shia online Ummah and the larger online Ummah? Uh, looking at the literature on all, there's a huge literature on that. So is, is, is it a specific form of online Uma emerging in this case or not? Uh, but there is, a, there is also a very interesting point about the Mindrits uh, in your uh, Imam Bara. Now these Mindrits are, and by the way, we have to also remember one thing that the functional aspect of a mosque and Imam Bara are two different things. And within Shia Islam, they are mosques. So Imam Bala is an addition to that. So we should not get confused that mosques are always Sunni and Imam Bala are always Shia. They are Sunni mosques as well as Shia mosques. And Imam Bala is something which is a other entity, which is a community space, more, mostly used on a few days, but it is also where you have to keep your stuff, the morning stuff which you keep there. So therefore, when the architecture of a mosque is renovated in Shia terms, it is very similar to the Sunni mosque. But when it comes to renovation of Imam Bada, we have to also look at the functional aspect of it. So these are the three or four comments which were coming out. Yeah, please. Um, we need to consider the very regional and provincial kind of uh, situation of the Kolkata Shias where perhaps no, I mean, normative global template uh, would be adequate to, uh, I mean, apply to interpret that. So it's like, uh, of course, this is the new, I mean, visual addition of the images of this, uh, I mean, uh, Shia authorial figures, but uh, the local Shias hardly they know the, I mean, uh, political importance of these figures and their, I mean, uh, their power to facilitate global Shiism and, uh, I mean, what kind of, uh, I mean, republic, uh, uh, Iran is and what kind of political dimension is there between Iran and Iraq and how that is connected to say, I mean, uh, the global uh, economic and political power in North America. So uh, these things are not clear to even the Shias living in the urban spaces. So for them, it's rather a more volatile and fluid kind of adaptation of visual tropes that is coming from the internet. That is for them a standardizing factor rather than getting into any contextual, theoretical, and also political interpretation of what global Shiism is. For them, global Shiism is a plethora of online artifacts which now they will imbibe to standardize their 
I mean, provincial and religious, I mean, regional uh, religious moorings. So this is so, I mean, so regional, so vernacular that the kind of uh, interpretation, the kind of logic that you may need to employ to understand the case of Lucknow or the case of, say, Mumbai. So that's not applicable in Bengal and also to be more precise in Kolkata. So if you go and ask people, they would say this is a prolific. I mean, uh, this, I mean, they won't be able to differentiate even between Iran and Iraq. And you would say this is our clergy from Iran. So that way of very, I mean, fluid, vernacularized understanding of their religiosity that I have found through my ethnographic work. So this is, but they know that this is something very important because, uh, because of their exposure to the visual archive online, they've understood that there is something called a kind of very structured kind of authorial setup somewhere. And they're very cautious about its intra-Islamic uh, significance and relevance. Uh, so you see only in Sharuni Aymambara where these images are, I mean, used. And uh, in one occasion, that is Ide Kadir, that these images are used uh, in front of Sitte Anabadi Mambara and along Mitya Bru's main road. Otherwise, nowhere in Kolkata till date, the 2023 Moharam is over. There was no, I mean, uh, uh, no use or display of the images of these figures. So at least, I mean, the more exposed ones, they have an idea that this might instigate some kind of, uh, I mean, not intra-Islamic rivalry, but a kind of discourse for the Shias, which might might which might not put, uh, might might not create certain sort of um, comforting kind of situation in the public sphere. This might rather create some kind of dissent or some kind. Of, they are, I would say, apprehensive. Mm -hmm. So it's like kind of apprehension that they feel. And for them, I would say, because of their propensity and because of their interest in the visual tropes, in the visual archive, they are rather interested in using the visual and also uh, bringing out very catchy phrases from the internet. So rather, they would use that to sensitize the community to create certain kind of, I mean, emotional affinity, I mean, towards the intercessory figures. So for them, the celebration of intercessory piety is more important than creating any theological, I mean, grounding. That's why I have already mentioned the announcement for sermons and the sermon preaching sessions, they are not very popular. Rather, the, I mean, text with visuals and graphics, I mean, graphics and tray text, they are more, more popular. So it is a kind of popular consumption that we need to mark as their affinity to social media. That's my first response. And secondly, if we look at, say, I mean, the power of visuality that is uh, in Bengal, so to speak, as a broader demography and also the urban space of Kolkata, generally the images of, say, Imam Ali or Imam Hussein, they are not very popular. The Imambaras are only full of ritual relics and artifacts, that is the cradle of Ali Asghar, Duldul, the replica of Duldul, the horse of Imam Hussein using various kinds of material, the phrases, I mean, like, um, I mean, all the names of Panjatan Park and some phrases in Arabic calligraphy in Zardusi, they are, are very popular. So as there has been an absence of these images, with the advent of the social media, these images are not included. So in the Imambaras in Bengal and also in the Imambaras of Kolkata, we don't find the repli I mean replica, I mean the I mean chip prints of the images of uh, Imam Hussein or Imam Ali, which are otherwise so popular, especially in calendar art. So if you go to the, I mean, Moharram Fair, you get to see several kinds of visuals with the sacred, uh, with the images of the sacred shrines and also sacred figures, which people buy. And there is not very stark Sunni Shia divide because the Kaaba is also available. And also, I mean, uh, the young uh, children, they are reading the Quran that is also available. And at the same time, the images of uh, uh, Imam Ali with a tiger beside that is also available as a sort of popular um, uh, stock. But generally, they are not made a part of the Imam Bada visual culture. In the Imambaras, it's only a reformulated, I mean, ritual relics where materiality changes only. 
uh, and and a kind of design of say the dul dul uh, i mean changes the design of the cradle of ali asgar changes so uh, i mean following and conforming to the idea of trans territorial images so that's one thing and even if the i mean figures of the march is there they are outside of the building of the imam bara they might be in the premises but outside of the imam bara building so they are not uh, included in the space of i mean main congregation inside and also a part of their ritual activities and the the third question and that is um what was the third one that is third one basically the nature of online yeah so uh, are there various kinds of online umma of course because if we look at uh, the i mean reception consumption of these online resources and uh, so response to that by creating new rituals and by uh, creating new online material so depending on the context these patterns of consumption and patterns of patterns of reception and patterns of participation everything changes so that's why i was uh trying to make a case for this multi locality and also uh micro local aspects of uh, the experience of kolkata even if you look at kolkata as an urban space the experience and response in media burus is different from the experience uh, in say uh, an, in and around the ripon street area bibiana where bibiana stands so depending on the Mm, pattern of uh, social media users depending on their context that is their uh, linguistic affiliations their class configuration and also uh, skills that is available in the vicinity the responses change as well and also it is also tied to the wider i mean context of intra islamic and uh, communal question that's why the experience of mumbai and lucknow are, are are so qualitatively different when we talk about the bengal context the kolkata as a city after the partition grew in a particular way when uh, the climactic very volatile and very i mean aggressive experience of uh, communal transaction conflict that subsided with uh, i mean newer governance and state policy and um, a more vested interest in class struggle the question of i mean communal difference i mean uh, uh, could be i mean i mean could be closed in a way but it it continued in a subterranean le level we know that how i mean communal difference and communal hatred can flow in the subterranean level but on the onset in i mean kolkata this uh, the city is not i mean does not articulate communally there is ignorance but it's not communally aggressive so that context actually um, works as 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 a sort of reason as a sort of logic for the kolkata shias who try to align with the cultural demographic cultural sensibility of the city that's why they constantly need to validate by either referring to mahatma gandhi by referring to say rabindranath tagore sometimes they refer to various other cultural figures like uh, abul kalam azad and um, not only in these i mean ashura processions where this anti uh, ca nrc these processions were taking place uh, the photograph of uh, rubindranath tagore became one of the major artifacts became one of the major i mean um, political artifact as is as a critic of the, the hindutva as a critic of uh, governance which is led by hindutva so there are various kinds of umma there are various kinds of online public and this online public uh, i mean does not stand on the idea of resistance that's where i want to end it is not a counter public this is like a kind of a, 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 an ethics of strategy and ethics of negotiation and sometimes um, to borrow um, a language from the mainstream public sphere to create a rhetoric of resemblance to bring shia islam close to the cultural uh, i mean demography of kolkata so to bridge the gap between the cultural space and shia islam as a religion so i want to mark something here that is when you talk about this third space that is space of representation we generally don't see self flagellation khun matam taking an entry in this online umma 
they deliberately do not, I mean, showcase, do not display self-flagellation as one of the core ritual, I mean, actions, performances of Shia Islam, which happens at the time of Ashura and the dates, I mean, uh, before Ashura, but when they are creating this online space of representation and archive, they are rather interested in showing what is happening inside the Imam Baras, I mean, um, as forms of, I mean, as the lament ritual, as forms of grieving without including self-flagellation because they think that that way they, would, they can bring uh, Shia Islam close to the cultural sphere of the online space. That way they would be able to socialize Shia Islam as an urban religion. So thank you very much thank for you. your questions. Questions? Thanks, it's uh, quite rich. Uh, I, I want to, you know, push you a bit further on the uh, vernacular uh, colorization, provincialization of Shaism. So is it uh, Ravindranath is the only symbol of Kol Kolkata? Of course, there is Vianaro and there are several other people. Uh, what about language, you know? It, it's about Mercia Khwani, it's about Noha Khwani. And uh, no uh, two Mercia Khwani and Mercia Khwanis are uh, similar. One is different from the other. Uh, so Anis and Tabir are the classic, uh, you know, uh, 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 poets. But there are so many variations to that. And local variations uh, that go against Shiaism or even Islam that can go, one has seen examples of that. So uh, what are words, you know? What is a Bengali version of Shias? How is it articulated in Bangla, right? It can't be just Lucknow and Lucknow is re being reproduced. You are saying it is provincialized. How is it provincialized in language? Thank you very much for the question because I didn't uh, have the, the scope to talk about the Bangla speaking Shias. So um, uh, actually there are two questions. Let me respond to the first uh, uh, first. That is um, in the neighborhoods. I mean, no accounts are chosen depending on their artistic and poetic skills. And uh, Dabir and Anis, they are not that popular in the Kolkata region. Rather, it's, I mean, the local North Khans who are the main producers, who used to be the main producers before the advent of uh, social media. After the social media, these older forms of Nohas are changing very rapidly. Otherwise, you will get the local Noha Khan, the main one, the major one, and the junior ones. They are, I mean, consulting together. They are exchanging their notes. And every year uh, for the Ashura procession, they are producing, composing new Nohas. So in the Ashura procession, the public, they're maintaining the old versions. But in the Imam Baras, we can see the entry of the new ones, which are, I mean, responses to the online resources. So that way, the older versions are there, the older tradition is there, and newer forms are emerging. That is, I mean, uh, paradigmatically changing the rhetoric of the Nohas at the same time, because it's, according to them, Josh, uh, these are more Joshila kind of thing. Previously, this was like full of grief and full of lament. And now it's like more like uh, full of prowess and all the prowess of grief, etc. But one cannot sort of screen the uh, influx of the new Nohas coming from the internet. And there, all these Pakistani Nohakhans, they are very, very important. I'm talking about Lucknow as a mediatory site. I'm not saying that, I mean, no comes from Lucknow, a Lucknowi culture, it is coming to Kolkata. Lucknow is the, is the, is the mediating factor, one. Secondly, uh, the Shias in the districts, they are Bangla speaking. Shias in Kolkata, they speak Bangla because of the hegemony of Bangla, but they know and they respond in Bangla. But basically there, there is a thin layer who are Urdu speaking and they are the chosen ones. They're chosen at the time of announcement. They're chosen to decide over something. They're chosen to tell the episodes of Karbala. Otherwise people use a very kind of everyday Hindi. But if you go outside of Kolkata, all the districts are Bangla speaking. There are hardly people because of the absence of, say, um, uh, because the Shias, 
cannot get into the Sunni madrasas. So they do, they go to the government schools where Urdu is not generally a language that is, I mean, that is generally taught. So for them, it's Bangla and English. And uh, English also is not that way uh, popular in the government schools of West Bengal. So Shias, they have access only to Bangla and in several, uh, I mean, neighborhoods in several districts, it's a prolific culture of the Bangla Mohas. Not even that, when new media emerged for the first time and it was the, that were, there were responses from the districts, there are lots of translations of the Urdu Nohas into Bangla, creating a new, I mean, reservoir for the Nohas with new rhetoric, new idioms, a new, newer kind of, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, identification and identitarian relations in the districts. There, a district called North 24 Parganas made a very important contribution, especially during 2012 to uh, 2015. And after that, with the disappearance of the CDs and the DVDs, and with the emergence of, say, social media and the internet, this, I mean, prolific practice of translation that actually subsided because of the lack of technical skill to deal with social media in the districts one and two, the barrier of language, because the social media, I mean, uh, social media medium is basically Urdu, even if Romanized, is Hindi, even if Romanized, which the Bengali speaking Shias are not versatile in. That's why as the social media users, the Bengali speaking Shias are not that proficient as yet because of different sorts of linguistic community uh, that is connected to the demographic distribution of the community. So. Thank you very much for the question. I really enjoyed uh, the complexity of what you found to capture. At one level, you're showing the extraterritoriality of the internet and how it redefines what we are calling human. Not, however, in the context of India's counterparts, but as public seeking to partake in the mainstream, why we able to show this difference? And you're also talking about how this extraterritoriality is vernacularized, uh, not necessarily post factor, it's not as if you're getting artifacts from Iran and that is being vernacularized, but it's the, the simultaneous process of you know, multi-local uh, and multi-mediated extraterritory. It's, it's a very, um, it, it helps us break out of the standard binary between the nation and the group. And that's what you're doing in your paper. I think it's really, really, very, very useful. Uh, but I really want to, I mean, it's in some ways, uh, in addition to what, I really hardly what you can to say. Is that is there more to be taught about what you are so beautifully describing uh, in terms of the difference between uh, the artifactual and visual world that the that social media produces, which is absolutely contemporary to the artifactual and the visual world of everyday practice from the moral affair to the actual physical possessions and the distinction you make between uh, what is shown on social media and what is actually happening of life. The youth and you are showing that you know something is changing that is the transition moment is lost after social media truly takes over. But you're also saying that you know the more of fear still continue and we have beautiful kinds of paintings and visual and calendar art, which the social media has not displaced. But they don't find a place in the social media and they don't find a place in the more popular sites, such as the interior of the mountain. But they find a place in the home and in the bed. Now, is <laughs> in terms of the relationship between offline and online, the standard show of the media studies, is there more to be taught about this relationship 
uh, beyond the description. So I'm just trying to get it. I was also thinking, what if we look aside of the visuality question and then actually uh, emphasize the reading through music, sound, the body, and act? In other words, one would think that it's very clear via the social media dimension of the moment. The very idea of mourning is being tried to <clears throat> right? It is yeah. a more benign kind of thing. Uh, you don't hurt yourself. Uh, the intensity of mourning is different. And you're also saying that Marcia and Noah's should be should not necessarily be grievous. It should also be fun, uh, whatever that might mean, a fun mourning. I'm just saying that if there's something to be thought about affect, body, which is more than a minority or minor, a minority of minorities trying to live this way. What is happening to the to religion per se, what we call religion, with all its intense physical and affective aspects? Uh, once, and uh, what the Hilal's example was super fascinating this debate about images in the North Indian uh, Muslim scholarly circles, if they're actually making a distinction between an image which is an idol and an image which is a virtual, and one being acceptable, one being not, it's a fascinating opening to the redefinition of religion per se. So I'm just really trying to think hard with you in terms of the real complexity of what you're trying to say. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for your suggestion because I actually um, haven't dealt with, as you have rightly pointed out, this, I mean, conceptual and theoretical part of visuality and sonic experience. So uh, it can be a very productive study if we talk about this affective body and felt body taking a kind of phenomenological understanding of religion here, where, I mean, a newer epistemology which has started with the introduction of this social media sound experience can be a very, I mean, critical and productive domain to understand how body as an affective entity changes with this changing, I mean, experiences. But I mean, uh, here there is no scope to talk about that. The, for that, I mean, um, I'll, I'll have to write, uh, so what can be done is 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 like uh, you know this minoritized doubly minoritized body as a site to understand the changing i mean configuration of affect which can be i mean phenomenological in itself and can be contextual because of the different kind of sociality that these bodies reside in and the different sort of cultural complex that this kind of urban uh, experience uh, gives to them and their responsibility towards this kind of urban experience. So this kind of idea of, I mean, acostomology mm -hmm. of Kolkata and also how this grieving body, self-flagellating body is uh, getting other sorts of formulation mm -hmm. as, as, an, as a source of affect that can, can be a very important study. But I have not pushed, I mean, that's a very important suggestion and I, I want to, I mean, push my work to that end rather than remaining in the primary descriptive analysis of some themes and historical changes. But this is a kind of primary basic assumptions that I need to make to situate my work. Uh, then I'll move towards a reading of epistemology as you have rightly pointed out. Thank you very much for the suggestion. Yes, yes, yes. No, in, in, yeah, in the trailer, it is there in a very concentrated manner, but the stereotype is there. The stereotype prevails. And, and uh, without any deliberation, which is the most important scary part, because the director does not carry staunch Hindutva inside. And this is, look how, I mean, 
the bengali middle class intelligentsia is without any sort of self reflection they actually what they are saying they are just discovering the enemy within <laughs> the territory they are not searching for the enemy outside of the border actually what the i mean uh, the i mean stuff mm -hmm. i mean i don't know whether this can be said like uh, what the political program is trying to do that is discovering the other within by creating the idea of a secondary citizen your the director is doing the same and he claims his legacy in the tagorean i mean tradition and also i i didn't respond to that question no uh, robindranath tagore is not the only cultural icon for them they are using his name strategically because nobody knows whether Rabindranath Tagore said this or not, and he didn't say this, but they are appropriating Rabindranath's figure to bring their religion close to a cultural space, which is more, I mean, uh, I mean, socialized and can give them a sort of validation. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it, this right to the city is a kind of claim for validation as a cultural space. Yeah. To add what she said, it reminds me of a very interesting film called Hari Bhari by Sham Benegal and Sham Benegal it is a Muslim social film and uh, there is a scene uh, Sham Benegal it's a progressive film and the entire family is standing and this person had a fight with his wife they wanted to make love wife refused they are outside and the person went uh, goes out and says ye shariat mein likha hai in front of the entire family. I'm Muslim, I haven't seen that anything like that in my family, but this is this shows the mindset of someone like Sham Benigal, who can think of a situation in front of the entire family, a person is saying that you have to have sex with me now, because it is written in Sharia. And long back, I think it's 1990s or something. Prabhat. this is the only representation of Moharram uh, on Bangla screen. So that's also very fascinating. When it comes on the screen, it comes like this. Uh, I uh, thank you very much for this richly detailed and uh, localized story of Sia Islam. I want to push you in the other direction. Uh, so there is this uh, very old Iran society in Kolkata and uh, there must be uh, many other associational and institutional uh, formations in Kolkata within and among the CIAs, I assume, I presume. Uh, so in your story, there seems to be no scope of all these kind of institutional uh, presence, which has trans-regional or transcultural connections uh, or probably uh, you didn't have time to articulate if you can reflect on or tell us more about that if or it, is it simply about the internet world that is that matters now thank you very much for the question the imam badas that i have shown which were consecrated um, in the mid 19th century, other than Sittainabad Imambara, which was founded by Wajed Ali Shah, all the Imambaras were founded by some or the other Iranian, I mean, family. So Kolkata, I mean, colonial Calcutta had a very vibrant presence of the diasporic Iranian society. And they actually came um, with, I mean, because uh, Calcutta actually offered the promise of economic growth and they actually um, started settling around the trade quarters of old colonial Calcutta, especially in the Barabazar area, Canning Street, the two Ripon Street in this part of the city. Um, and these uh, imambaras mm, were managed by the wakaf, I mean, board. That is, uh, you know what wakaf board is. Uh, but because of some, I mean, family feud and some kind of legal dispute, at, at a point of time, all these wakaf board was dismantled by the Calcutta High Court uh, by creating a registered, I mean, uh, managing trusty board for the individual imambaras. And I mean, because of the growth of the, I mean, 
uh, migra migrant um, uh, communities from say Rajasthan, from Gujarat, and also from, from other parts of North India, we can see the marginalization of the Iranians as the as, as an economic community. So they started migrating back or move out of Kolkata. And 1947, the independence and the partition uh, became the most important historical moment for their final, I mean, uh, dispersal from the city. So in Kolkata itself, you don't find more than two, three Iranian, I mean, families. The Bagwali Koti, I, I refer to, I mean, Bagwali Koti Mambara, that is still, I mean, managed by an Iranian family, which has kept the interior intact, which is still, which still exude the charm of mid 19th century. But this is the only family, Iranian family. And if you talk about the institutions, uh, there is the Iran society. And other than that, there is no so-called Iranian institution in Kolkata. And in a, Iranian society has nothing to do with these Ira Imambaras. The Imambaras, all the Imambaras, even if primarily established by the Iranian families or hold by it, I mean, I, I mean, uh, possessed by the um, Iranian families, now they are... Uh, managed by the local uh, representatives from the Shia community, who actually came from basically from uh, Uttar Pradesh and Bihar at different points of time through intermittent migration. So uh, that way, now we do not find the, I mean, uh, residual of so-called Iranian uh, culture or institutes or their functioning in Kolkata so much. But these uh, Imambaras are there, still, I mean, preserving the old artifacts, the chandeliers, I mean, some uh, ritual relics with, with uh, I mean, a pair of fish uh, above um, a mirror. So, and the, I mean, uh, the sign of the sun and the lion, all these Iranian, I mean, royal motifs, they're still there inside this Imambara, especially Haji Karbala Imambara, which was, um, which I, I show the interior of it, all these artifacts, starting from the chandeliers to the mirrors, to the alums and other things they were brought from Iran. And they are all these old stuff, which came in the mid 19th century. So thank you very much for this question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much for this talk. It, it was very enriching. Um, uh, my question is in um, alignment with Professor Banerjee's yeah. uh, comments. Uh, I'm thinking that um, how to think of the word territory because trans-territory is a term that appears in the paper. How to think of uh, the term territory in terms of the noise, uh, perception of noise. Uh, the reason I am uh, willing to think about noise in this context, uh, there are many. One would be, uh, since you have mentioned Patrick Eisenlor's work uh, and sonic atmospheres and uh, sonic and discursive experiences, something that you have mentioned, uh, I'm thinking of how noise is perceived across several dimensions. For instance, uh, I'm thinking in terms of David Novak's theory of noise, where he writes that noise does not have an absolute meaning. Uh, it is. It has always been the other, where uh, the understanding of music has been formulated and the remnant other has been noise. Now I'm thinking of noise in two registers. One is religious and the other is governmental. And the reason being I'm thinking along the lines in which how religion and democracy intersect or come in a dialogue. For instance, according to the Central Pollution Control Board, uh, the noise levels, the limit is 55 decibels probably, if I'm not wrong. Uh, now, interestingly, Kolkata happens to be... Uh, uh, in according to the recent report by uh, uh, UN Frontiers, uh, is one of the 15 top most noisiest cities in the world. And probably uh, the noise level somewhere varies around 80, 90 decibels probably. If that be the case, I'm thinking now uh, across all religious sites, uh, if I look at uh, the Islamic spaces uh, in uh, Kolkata, then since the sounds are now mediated, uh, 
in private spaces i won't call private spaces but mediated through uh, digital gadgets devices across very many spatial confines then what happens to noise at a perceptual level if i may call it at the phenomenological level for instance and how does it refer or how does it answer questions of communal conflict resistance and the intricacies within the community for instance a particular sound which is considered as religious by a group might not be religious or sacred for a different group probably they are sharing the same space but now i'm just thinking in terms of the online media uh, how these sounds are getting mediated through the phone smartphone and people who are sharing similar spaces or uh, remain within a certain range of proximity how does it refer or how at the perceptual level how at the level of feelings perceptions experiences how uh, noise operates or how this otherization or differentiation between tolerable sound unacceptable sounds or operate yeah this understanding of noise and tolerance and acceptance uh, with this we again go back to the question communal question and intra islamic rivalry which actually uh, create the i mean elements of epistemology here so if we talk about this urban epistemology you have because of the uh, Uh, coexistence of religious heterogeneity we have multiple kinds of soundscape we have multiple kinds of epistemology which is religious epistemologies so if we talk about the uh, say the shias they are very particular about their i mean about creating their sonic ecosystem that way as i have mentioned in my uh, talk that is the imam baras when the imam baras and the mosque they are in close proximity from the imam baras this digitized version either the digitized version or the live presentation of the nohas the microphones are i mean uh, i mean set say it in such a way that it does not go beyond say 100 and 150 uh, meters in the public space along the road so if you come in front of the imam bara you get to hear that then you go away from there either it is subsumed in the regular noise of the city the noise of traffic and the pedestrians and the shops and etc and also as you proceed towards the mosque at several points the azan the sound of azan takes over and rather the sound of azan because of the more i mean significant presence of the sunnis and because the so sonic articulation of the sunnis are uh, articulations of the sunnis are more conflicting if we talk about a mainstream hindu majority public sphere there the shias uh, try to find the niche epistemological space for themselves one number two if we talk about personal sharing of this sound so generally the sound is shared through whatsapp uh, through bluetooth or something like that so in a confined space like in the imam baras and also in the imam bara courtyards if there is some sharing of sound that does not affect the mainstream i mean ecosystem because that is happening there and secondly of course we know that is again uh, connects to uh, professor banerjee's question how to talk about the affect of listening and how to talk about certain sort of embodiment that is connected to this kind of listening and that gets changed according to the newer kind of listening so we can talk about various phenomenological understanding of this kind of listening and if we talk about say qualitative changes in terms of the materiality of sound intonation of the sound there is a paradigmatic difference between the older forms of i mean noha its musicality its uh, utterance and enunciation and the newer forms of soundscape which is more i would say technologized which is more synchronized which i would say eliminates any sort of noise from the from the from the from the domain of so called sound slash music if we can call it music we won't for the for the technical reason we are calling it music so there when say nadim sarwar is presenting in the music video it is curated sound and the shias this new kind of sonic experience provide them with the curated experiences of sound which was absent previously which was live and was full of i mean noise which means the experience of the lived body so it was not the sounding body of the noha khan or the sarman preacher it is the presence of the receivers that actually used to complete still it completes the soundscape so their noise was a kind of 
uh, I mean, conceptually was inherent in the presentation of these, in, in these, uh, I mean, sonic practices, which has become rather linear when we're talking about the use of uh, digital videos and all. But when these digital video, videos are played in a certain sort of cityscape, it gets mingled with the sound of the cityscape, giving rise to the, the idea of noise as integral to the soundscape experience of sound and also as the context of sound. And depending on the different context of sound, the experience of those sonic, uh, sonic I mean, uh, perception of that sonic changes. And at the same time, the context of the prevalent soundscape in different city neighborhoods, urban neighborhoods, actually, uh, I mean, impacts upon the consumption of sound. At that way, I was talking about Sittayanabad Imambara, where there are several microphones that is, I mean, looming large. There is a broader soundscape, right? So a kind of rights to the city by creating an acostemology is rather higher in Sittayanabad Imambara rather than in, say, Rubindra Sharoni where the numbers, I mean, number of uh, imambaras is higher. So it will, again, uh, if we talk about the affective experience, I would push that, I mean, phenomenological reading to the material context as well. And that is perhaps the next, I mean, state that we'll be taking from here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. I was just wondering, uh, because you're also talking about the online communities and the mobilization of certain kind of figures, authorial figures, etc. Uh, but, and you're saying that it's not a counter public which is being animated. So in the digital realm, what is the kind of validation or popularity or a sense of belonging that people are trying to forge? Like what is the, uh, so to speak, digital big other that uh, that people are imagining themselves as animating in response to? Like, is it uh, the idea of a formation of a global Shiite community or is it to seek uh, local uh, groupings or facilitate, you know, like why is there a, a mobilization of all these online artifacts? Is, is that something that you also kind of probe? If I get you right uh, to respond to that, um, these Shias used to live in a very confined, I, I'll come back to the question of territory here. So um, okay. in a very territorialized kind of spatial, I mean, urbanity, where there was no mobility, even the experience of the Shias in the districts, in the villages, were not connected to the urban experience of the Shias. So social me media actually offered them uh, perhaps for the first time, the, I mean, offered them the idea of a bigger, wider, global uh, sort of community where they belong to, which inculcate, they inculcated some kind of confidence in them. And they wanted to belong to that space. And when they tried to belong to that space, I tried to make this argument that they responded from their very territorialized, very regional uh, context, where there are some, I mean, uh, cultural coordinates and other political, I mean, uh, formations in West Bengal from where they were tra trying to respond to. And if we look at this community formation, say, uh, in other parts of the Shia world, this, say, some emotion like anti-caliphate stance is rather higher. And while standardizing a global discourse on Shiism, I mean, uh, to validate the imame, there are various, I mean, statements which uh, are based on very stark intra-Islamic, I would say, uh, I would say conflict, uh, or, or, um, or sometimes it sounds uh, really coercive. I mean, uh, that way, these Shias, when they, when they try to create uh, an online archive and also reformulate their uh, the physical dimension of their rituals. They create a globalized form of those rituals, but at the same time, they vernacularize their uh, the global template that they get, get access to. I don't do not know whether you wanted to know this. So it's a kind of simultaneous process 
what I mark as the vernacular cosmopolitanism for the Shias to claim their right to the city. That is, they are uh, receiving the global template and while receiving, they are vernacularizing it. And while vernacularizing it, they are globalizing their expressions. So it's a mutually constitutive process. And I, I try to, I mean, locate some tenets of this vernacular cosmopolitanism. Thank you very much. So I think it's almost two hours. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. For the it was really fascinating. Thank you for thank your you questions. For they helped me a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.